Hello and happy Thursday everybody. I'm Diana Kennedy and you're joining us once again for another iHomeschool Network iHomeschool Hangout each and every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, noon Mountain Time and 11 a.m. on the Pacific Coast. You'll find the bloggers of IHN iHomeschool Network here discussing homeschool and family management topics. Today's topic is one that I'm super excited about. I don't have a whole lot of experience, but I um, would love to learn. We're going to be discussing nature studies. I have a great, great setup of panelists I'm here to talk to you guys and to field your questions from the event room. We're also excited that we have a friend, Barb McCoy, from handbookofnaturestudy.com. She's going to give away a year subscription to her Ultimate Naturalist Library to one of our live listeners. It's a $45 value. It's got all 12 of Barb's current ebooks, 36 archived newsletters, new monthly printables, and new challenges that start out in August. If you want to throw your name in the hat, um, Marlene's going to pick a winner randomly from the event page, so give us a holler out over there. Let us know that you're watching. I'll throw up a question or a comment, um, and that way we'll get you in the running. Okay? All right, let's introduce uh, my panelists that I've got here with me today, and then we'll get started on talking about some talking points here for Nature Studies, and then also checking your questions, too. Cindy, you want to get us started? You have to unmute yourself there. You there, there you go. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Cindy West. I blog at OurJourneyWestward.com, and I have a Nature Study business at shiningdawnbooks.com where I write um, nature explorer studies that are um, they just give you all the ideas you need for nature study so I'm hoping that we can talk a lot about nature today and get you guys out and creatively get your kids doing some science enjoying school awesome Heather Woody introduce yourself for us hi everyone I'm Heather Woody I blog at blogshewrote.com I am a former science educator. I'm really always a science educator, but um, I blog there. My kids are um, high school down to elementary school, and we do a lot outdoors. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us again today, Heather. Jamie Worley's back with us again today to talk about some nature studies. Jamie, introduce yourself. Well, I'm Jamie Worley, and I blog at cjamieblog.com. Uh, mostly just about real life and homeschooling. Uh, we love nature studies. Um, just we do it informally. We've done it now for uh, gosh, I think this is our eighth year of homeschooling, and that was one of our very first things. So fun. So I'm excited to talk about this today. Awesome. Marlene Griffith is here with me today to help things run smoothly behind the scenes. Marlene. Hey guys, I'm happy to be back again today. Um, I blog at diligentheart.com. And I will be pulling in your comments from the event room, and also I will be picking a random winner for our giveaway today. So make sure you guys are interacting over there, and I will pull someone's name out at some point. <laughs> awesome. Susan Evans is joining us today. Susan? I'm Susan Evans from SusanEvans.org. I love hands-on learning, and we have done nature journals for quite a few years, so I'm excited about talking about nature study. Awesome. This is a great topic for us after we have um, hopefully made it out of the never-ending winter. Um, I want to remind everybody that's watching um, watching or listening, make sure that you pop over in the event room because I know a lot of our panelists and also another, other bloggers from IHN have shared lots of resources over there as well that you might, might want to take a look at. But let's just start off by um, talking about why is nature study important in your home school? May want to tackle that one for me? I'll start. No. <laughs> or Cindy can, either way. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. Um, for us, nature study is really super important because um, I have active children, and being outside in the sunshine and fresh air where they are able to move around is super important to them. I'd say maybe that's the the very first reason we started with nature study that and the fact that we're Charlotte Mason homeschoolers so we were kind of prompted to do that um, but it has become just a fabulous time of family time and 
science time and Bible time. We see God's fingerprints all over everything in nature, and we are able to hit on every single um, science that there is in nature. So it's been an awesome way to dive deep into um, our science studies. And for the most part, that's what we do in elementary school for science. So that's me. Excellent. Jamie, you want to expand on that? Well, sure. Um, like Cindy, we... Uh, well, we're, we, we're still, we still love the Charlotte Mason way, and we incorporate a lot of that. But when we first started, we were very Charlotte Mason. And um, I just had one sweet little quiet girl at the time, and uh, she loved that. I grew up um, just, my dad was very nature-focused, and so we grew up, um, or I grew up doing so many things like going on hikes and work, watching him work in the garden and sort of kind of helping. And so those were just um, fond memories that made me appreciate nature. I wanted to pass that on to Catherine, too, um, and then as the years have gone on, we've realized how many things we can learn just out doing nature studies, whether they're, um, you know, planned ahead of time or just, hey, look at this tree blooming and let's talk about it or, or whatever. It's, it's great. And now, by the way, I have two more little people who, like Cindy, also are very active, <laughs> um, so it does them good to be out. Um, burning off some energy and soaking up the sunshine too. Absolutely. I know we have, we've, I think we've got a pretty wide age range of, of people, um, student-wise. Um, I have um, preschoolers to early elementary, basically like, um, or tod toddlers, toddlers to um, like second grade. I think Cindy's are younger too. You've got a wider age man, I think, Jamie. Susan? Yeah, got preschool to uh, 13 at home. Okay. I Susan's kids are older. Oh. I have a 17-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 7-year-old. Okay. Heather's are kind of middle school range. Is that right, Heather? I can't remember. I have a high schooler. I have a 10th grader, an 8th grader, a 6th grader, and a 3rd grader. And we started um, doing nature studies because I think nature studies points to our creator. It's a great way to introduce our kids and keep them connected um, with the one who made the world. And that's, so that's how we got started. And then we keep going because it provides a lot of science. And my daughter, I, I put in the event room um, the snake project that she's been working on this year that's been her biology course. And it started with an observation of a whole pile of snakes in our backyard. So that's been a good thing for her. Yeah, my kids are um, ages 8 to um, almost 14, but we've been doing nature studies since they were babies and toddlers. You can really do this with any age, um, and I've put in the event room two different things that you can do with really young toddlers. One of them is an egg carton. You can put different colors from nature, have the kids paint the different colors in each little container, and then have it dry overnight, and then you go out on a nature hike and try to uh, match those um, nature finds into like the green into the green like that kind of thing the kids just love doing that and another thing we did was um, a nature bracelet where all it is is packing tape okay so you put packing tape sticky side up and then the nature finds that they find outside, either, either in the um, backyard or on the nature hike, they put on top of it. And then you stick another one down on top, and then you make a little bracelet for them, and then they're, they're, they have nature with them. So those are two simple things you can do. But really, have them just enjoy nature and see uh, what kinds of things, um, you know, watching the little insects crawling along and uh, things like that, just enjoying it so that they have that interest for later um, in life. I'm glad that you mentioned that because I, one of the talking points I have written down here in front of me is at what age can you start nature studies? Um, so Susan's made it really obvious for us that um, little kids absolutely love it. Um, I know my twins are almost six, uh, and I have another daughter that's nearly eight. They've been getting out, and without even my help, um, doing a lot of explore, exploration, a lot on their own. Um, 
bringing home tadpoles and salamanders and various things that they find in the creek, which luckily, since their mother is a country girl, does not gross me out. So I'm like, okay, fine, let's just bring it in. And we learned very quickly how to kill the tadpoles immediately. That was mom's contribution to a science study. <clears throat> not tap water ladies uh, so gotta set that out for a little bit um, so the little kids are great with nature studies um, I know I saw a question from the event room about what do you what thing when they're younger it's na it's more natural they, they love it um, I'd love to hear somebody had mentioned about um, middle school and high schoolers kinda how do you keep them in it's easy to keep the little kids engaged because that's that's great. They're digging in the mud with sticks and, and stomping in creeks and whatnot. But your middle school and high schoolers uh, might be a little over that by that point. So let's hear from you guys about um, like how would you keep your your older kids engaged? Well, one of the um, things that I've seen so much is because I started with my now 13-year-old when she was little, um, it's just become kind of a part of her life. And now that we have the two little ones, the five and six-year-old, she'll come in and be like, hey, mom, can I do a nature study with them? And they'll, she'll be fine and stuff. And so she's become the teacher in so many things, uh, which is just, I think it gives her like a little extra. Um, incentive or a little passion, you know, to have these little people that she gets to show all this cool stuff to. And a lot of it is things that we did, you know, five, six, seven years ago, and then she's getting to do them all over again, but through the eyes of little people. So that's been fun. One thing I might add, um, mine have been very much involved since they were little as well but if you don't have some who've been involved and you want to get them involved or you want to keep your older kids uh, when we go on nature walks we typically go with a purpose in mind so it's kind of like a lesson I wouldn't say that every single time we do sometimes it's just for walk sometimes it's just for stomping in the creek or finding what we can but a lot of times we go out with a purpose in mind um, today we're going to look for such and such and we're going to take this field guide and we're going to learn about it and when we come home we're going to research about it so you can really turn it into lessons and let your big kids know hey we're not just out here playing this is fun and this is awesome and you're glad you don't have to sit at the desk right now but it is part of your school um, and I have found that you know when we just walk and maybe they have all these other things that they could be home doing that they are not quite as engaged but when they realize that it's part of their lesson they get into the flow of oh, I'm outside learning and this is wonderful and thank you mom for not making me sit down and do this today and I can't wait to go and find out what these things are that we just found and and you give them big kid stuff to do like um, photographing or um, it, some some science research that they've been doing maybe in their science textbooks let's take this out into nature and see how it really fits in so that's just some a few ideas for older kids from me Love that idea too. Heather, um, do you have anything to add in here? Well, I was just going to say with older kids, I agree with Cindy, you have to make it part of their day that this is a requirement. I often don't give my kids a choice about that because um, then they might opt for something different. So we go out with with definitely a purpose in mind. We're going to see if we can find this or that um, so that we can observe it back in at home or things like that. I also make it part of their coursework. So um, I have two kids that are studying biology this year, one more traditionally and like I said my eighth grader is doing her biology through the filter of a snake project. So She's been doing lots of different things based on observation and um, she needs to get out in the field to do a lot of work too. Excellent. Um, that's a good segue. Um, I have another little point here to write down. So do you, as a whole overall, and it sounds like we've kind of answered this question already, um, how directed should a nature study be? Meaning are you in charge? Do you let the kids just kind of cavort around? I think we're, we're coming from a couple of different um, mindsets here, like me. I just let the kids kind of go and do what they please. Um, Cindy's a little bit more directed, a little bit more directed than I am. Um, what are your thoughts there, Susan? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on you for this one. Sure. You got, you got, you got let, you got, you have a lesson in mind, or you just kind of let the kids kind of take, take it where it's gonna go. Okay, I do both. Um, I do the majority of their nature journals, and it's like, okay, if you could see this, this is a smaller nature journal. Here's kind of a bigger 
um, nature journal and they use stickers and stuff uh, to decorate it on the outside and um, so okay so what I do is I let them know that they can express themselves and what they're learning in nature and so they choose different things and they uh, draw them they write about it um, and that kind of thing but then if we are studying something specific like let's say we're studying uh, spiders and then we look for spiders we look for spider webs they can draw a spider and and a spider web that's nearby and um, connect the two and talk about how the spider acts when it's uh, building that um, that spider web and stuff like that so they're learning quite a bit uh, doing that so um, what we did actually for a full year is we did nature journals only and um, but I had some directed study like Cindy was saying I had directed study on some days and other days the majority of the time they had freedom uh, but if we had studied something and I had read a book about it for example or read a section about it then um, we were focused on that and so we wanted to um, you know do um, that particular topic so that's how we do it may I jump in for a moment Okay, um, for us, I would say the same thing as Susan is some walks we just go out and we just walk. We just have a good time. Sometimes we go out and um, from the Charlotte Mason standpoint, she might say, you know, Mom, you sit back and you let your kids go find what they want to find and then have them come back to you and just kind of narrate it. Tell them every, tell you everything they can about it. And then maybe they go and draw it and then maybe they kind of even keep a calendar of how the thing changes over the year. Um, so... So we can go on walks that have no activity other than let's just go and find what we can. We have walks that you're giving them a specific goal but not necessarily saying we're going to study this. And then you have walks where um, maybe you do have a goal in mind and I would say Susan reminded me, you know, there are times that we go out and we just walk, we find something cool and then we come back and learn about it. So it can kind of go backwards too. Um, so play for sure play in nature have fun in nature and then sometimes especially for those kids who are kinda like what are we even doing out here that's when it really probably needs to be a little bit more directed and I think one thing to remember especially with the littles is it's about creating the love of nature and as they get older you can get more um, you know as directed as you want or you know give them all kinds of we're really relaxed homeschoolers but you know, there are so many other things you can do with that, like um, like Heather's daughter with the snake study. That's so cool, and um, and all those things. But um, with the little ones, it's just about like like yesterday afternoon, I went out to look at the trees, to whatever, in in our backyard to check on some things and figure out where I was planting. And I ended up walking around with the two little ones following me around for um, like 30 minutes, just talking about trees and that, like they can tell me all the trees that are in our yard and things about them, and and they think it's cool. And uh, so that's just going to make things so much easier as they get older to have that base and that, um, well, Charlotte Mason always talked about having relations with things. It's, you know, you sort of have a personal relationship with that tree that you can climb in the backyard. And then later you can learn more about, you know, uh, the little um, maple keys that fall off it to grow new trees and, you know, all that kind of thing. But it's, it's creating those relations and the excitement about getting out in nature. Awesome. I love listening to you guys talk about all this. What about, um, so um, I have a, another question here. What, what do you do back inside um, to follow up on the nature walk that you started out here? You know, you guys are out exploring maple trees and snakes and oh my gosh, Susan, spiders. Okay, now that, that one, I'd rather, yeah, the spider one got me. Ugh. Um, snakes, I'm fine with lizards, whatever turtles. You know, as long as you're washing your hands. But uh, yeah, not not so much the spiders. So after you've been out there studying all this stuff outside, um, how do you come in and um, direct your focus on on follow up, like um, the collections uh, that Heather does, or nature journals for Susan, that kind of stuff. Um, so talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I think it depends on what's going on and what your kids are into. So when my kids were younger, um, the three oldest would often come in and we'd do a nature journal entry together 
or we oftentimes will see something in the field that we aren't sure about and we'll come and try to find out what it is when we get back if we didn't have the right field guide with us because we almost never leave home without a field guide and I keep some in the car just in case we stop somewhere but um, if, if it's something that we want to learn more about they can do that now that my kids are older I don't do as much prescribed work with them because they all have something different that they focus on so my boys are not really into nature journaling and I'm okay with that um, my eight-year-old is an entomologist and he'll pin his insects and he has to identify them and and so that's kind of his journaling and what he does my daughter loves to illustrate and do botanical work so she'll work on her drawings and paintings and she actually collects things my high schooler he just likes to take it in and actually he has his falconry license so he's going to be spending a lot of time training a raptor and uh, so that's his thing he's a bird guy and um, my and Isaac he's just a cautious guy that kind of takes it all in but as long as they learn that lifelong appreciation I'm good with it that's where we are like Heather um I have a couple of children who are sort of self-motivated and so we can go out on a walk and then we can come back in and I can say you know what nature journal do some research um, you know I can I can give them just you need to do something with the nature walk and they will do that um, I have another one who needs to be a little bit more guided directed um, if we've just gone out on a weekly nature walk we're just having fun we're just looking at things where um, maybe reading and field guides then there's not necessarily an activity that happens back at home but a lot of times we're out for that purposeful walk so I have a purpose in mind when we get home um, an experiment maybe we're going to make models rather than um, write in the nature journal maybe we're going to take the photographs that we took on the walk and maybe we're going to put them together on a big poster and kind of classify the different animals or plants it just really depends on what you're doing um, that's that's something that was important to me and really that's where the nature explorers studies were born because my mind doesn't always work quickly so I needed to be like okay here's the walks we're gonna go on and then here's the things we can do afterwards and so I wrote those down for myself um, and this has really helped us kind of turn nature study more into more than just walking outside and coming back in we go outside with that purpose in mind and then we come back in and do something with it so I'm sure these other ladies have awesome ideas too. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, sometimes younger kids cannot draw ba um, something from real life. Let's say, for example, that your kids are looking at a dragonfly and um, you don't want to miss what that dragonfly is doing. So you observe the dragonfly until it goes away. So when you go home, you look up um, a dragonfly or maybe a how to draw a dragonfly. See, this was done by a six-year-old boy. I don't know if you could see that it's probably too bright okay I guess oh here we go can you see that yeah so basically um, a six-year-old boy drew this just little by little one step at a time after having watched that insect and so um, if you give a real insect even in a jar to a kid um, okay so it's easier um, if you have something trapped in a jar or something to draw it, um, it but um, it's easiest to find a step-by-step -step how to draw something if you're um, working in your nature journal and something like that then you can um, help your kids to have more success so that they don't feel like a failure so don't make them draw something right uh, you know at first until they've gained the skills necessary and I mean this is the same for an adult I mean I don't have that good um, of drawing skills myself and so um, until I had more skills in uh, drawing I wasn't able to draw it just from have looking at it in nature and then um, we were talking about uh, Heather was talking about collections we also have tons of nature collections up on our wall and stuff um, and on my blog I actually have a um, nature display ideas I'll put that um, as a link in the event room a little bit later but you can do collections straight into your um, nature journal for example you see these pressed flowers 
Okay, and then you can, um, so you, you press them, you can press them e either in a press or in a heavy book and dry them out um, for a few days, uh, just smashing them, uh, and as long as they're dry, um, you can put them into your nature journal. Now, I just stick it down with packing tape. I know it does not last forever, but like the one I showed you is three years old and it's not uh, disintegrated yet. But I mean, it's not like an heirloom thing. It won't last forever, I'm sure. So you could find maybe an acid free way to do it. Um, you could also put it maybe in plastic bags or something like that. I don't know. But for now, we enjoyed it and looked at it and then we are able to label them and stuff like that at home. So that's how you can bring uh, things home as collections even straight into your nature journal. Awesome. Thank you, Susan. I know that um, Marlene had a question to bring in from the event panel and we're going to actually use that as a segue to kind of talk about some of the tools that you ladies use. Um, uh, we'll cover some, of the, some that we have already at least mentioned and then some new stuff too. Marlene? All right, so um, Sarah Ruiz, she asks, where do we get a field guide for young kids? I'm going to pick on Heather Woody and um, ask, tell her to explain what a field guide is because some people may not know, like I don't have any idea what that is, uh, and then talk to them about what, what you had recommended. Okay, so field guide. Um, there's actually, well, field guides are mostly pictures and explanations of what you'll find out there. There's lots of different companies that publish them. Peterson is one that uh, publishes guides for young kids. There's always the Golden Books. Those are classics. They've been around a long time. And um, almost every company, whether it's Audubon or Peterson, Golden Book will sell something that is for younger kids in addition to the to the other ones. And also I think um, they don't necessarily have to be for little kids. You can help them learn how to use them and if, if, as long as they have some nice pretty pictures in there. Um, you know like we have a little bird one for the, I think it's Peterson's for Eastern birds and it's mostly just like, a, a, they have one that's more detailed but this just has like a big picture of the bird and it has um, like it's color coded so you can, well I saw a red bird, what would that be? So you go to the red pages and, um, you know, Catherine's used that since she was, like, first grade and been able to find things. And, and it also helps, um, like Susan was talking about, to give something if they want to draw it in their nature journal. You know, you've got a little thing, and, and it helps you to remember, wait, did that have black on just its neck, or was that, you know, because sometimes you can't remember once you get home and, and whatever. But so I don't think it necessarily has to be for young kids, just, um, you know, something that's, friendly to look at and and uh, and we have all these other a, a bunch of just naturey books that the kids will look through and some of them are animals we have around here we don't have tigers thankfully but um, you know that comes up in conversation and stuff so um, <laughs> you know but it's fun Susan was actually holding up something uh, on camera what was that Susan Yes, um, this is a field guide just so you know what it looks like. So you can um, just see what the different shapes of the leaves are and then um, you can identify the tree based on the leaves, that kind of thing. That's what it looks like. So it looks kind of like this. This is the Audubon one. It does not matter what brand you get. You can often get these at yard sales for like 50 cents. So. Little people, um, one trick I use for them with the big people field guides is we get little tiny stickers, you know, the little smiley face stickers that you can buy. And as we come across things that we see, we just stick a sticker on that picture. And so they can go through the big people field guide and they can say, well, we found this before. And we literally filled up almost an entire wildflower book over the years doing it this way. From the time my oldest was little, we just keep filling in every time we find a new flower. And, you know, if you have different children, that are using the same field guide, they could maybe use yellow stickers for one child, blue stickers for another. Um, and so that's been really, really fun for our little people. And I, I've loved seeing, I've, 
I love remembering myself. What have we really found in the past? <laughs> There's also, um, I found, it did cost something. Most of the time I like free apps, but this was a, um, I think it's Audubon, and it's for like iPhone, and you can um, find your bird and uh, you know make a list of all the ones that you've seen, and that's pretty fun, especially if you are one of those people that always has your iPhone with you because you can help, it can help you identify it, and it'll even like, you know, play the little bird call for you. So if you're hearing one, you might be able to figure it out. That sounds like fun. Um, do you guys have there, other tools that, besides the field guides that you recommend? Go ahead, Heather. Well, I was just going to say other kinds. Of, it's not a field guide, but it's called a dichotomous key, which um, you have to really pay attention to characteristics of the organism that you're looking at so that you can eliminate characteristics and find what it is that you're looking for. Uh, those are fun for older kids because um, it eliminates pretty quickly and will send you to the, to the right thing. Um, they're, the ones that we use are called like tree finder, there's a fern finder, and you can find those on Amazon. Um, with the, um, a lot of people have the app, we use iBird Pro, but I just want to caution you that um, we always uh, learn to go around um, constantly making the call go on your phone because it does confuse actual birds um, who are busy with survival and not using that often is a good, is a good thing. We often take pictures too, so we can look at it later on. So I'm glad that you mentioned. Uh, well, I'm so sorry. I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was going to ask Jamie about uh, if they use their camera a lot. Go ahead, Cindy. I was just going to say some other supplies that we have found really super helpful. A camera, just any kind of camera, because my kids love to document what they find. And like Susan was talking about, they can take pictures. If they've left the item out in the field, they can take those pictures and use them to help them draw as well. Um, we also constantly are packing magnifying glass or tweezers. Um, we're packing rulers and yardsticks, not not yardsticks, little tape measures, um, because we love to measure things. We will find things inevitably that we're like, oh my goodness, what's the circumference of this giant tree? Or um, we've come across thorns that are, you know, yay big, and we want to just document how big are these things that we're drawing in our nature journal or photographing. Um, and then finally, a nature journal with some kind of writing utensils, whether it's a pencil and an eraser or some colored pencils. Um, and we like to kind of shake it up a little bit. And sometimes we'll bring watercolors, um, especially if we're going down to a pond. And we'll just dip our, our um, paintbrushes in the pond or in the little creek and and paint there. So I like to spice it up. I, we don't bring all that stuff all the time because that would be a horrendous pack to carry. But something different each time to kind of inspire my kids. I'm going to pack all my kids in the car and just drive up the road to Cindy's house <laughs> so we can just go out <laughs> on the farm uh, and, in the, and in the woods to go check out some of the stuff. Well, those are some great ideas. I love it. Um, I Marlene, think you get extra. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just you, go, you go ahead. I think you get bonus points for doing watercolor with actual like pond water or creek water there, Cindy. That's like extra cool. I know that my kids would love that idea. Um, Marlene's got somebody else. Oh, there's a question about um, homeschool, not homeschooling. Um, nature studies at different times of the year. What about that, uh, Marlene? Okay, so Karen, she asked. Um, I don't know if she meant um, colder, but she says, "What do you do during the closer months of the year?" I need motivation then. I always want to stay inside by the fire. So yeah, she meant colder months of the year. Um, I would like to say something about um, if you have snow um, where you live, uh, prints of animals in the snow are fabulous because the white against the black, you know how the, um, the paws sometimes go all the way down to the ground. So it is sharp looking and you can see the tracks. One time we had a deer that came into our backyard and we are in a city. We are not in the country. And so it was shocking that it was eating our food, our um, vines on our tree. 
and it had come over our chain link fence and everything and it was just crazy and um, and so we ran out and snapped pictures of the tracks of that deer and then come to find out we looked at the front of our house in the snow and sure enough there were raccoon prints and those are they have super long fingers and so uh, you know you know if it is raccoon or not based on those long long finger those paw prints and so we started studying paw prints and that kind of thing um, so you can look at how animals are acting in the different seasons um, but yeah definitely in the in the winter it's a wonderful time to uh, go on a nature hike. We have gone um, on a nature hike when it's snowing. And yes, I okay, so it was snowing outside. And and it was just looked beautiful because the sun was shining. If you can get the sun shining, well, not you get, but if you can find a day when the sun is shining and it's snowing, oh my goodness! I just looked out the window and I'm like, oh, let's go on a nature hike. And the kids screamed, it squealed with joy. I mean, no matter what age they were, and um, you can get like an umbrella to keep from getting completely drenched. But we saw so much. The kids were exploring everything, and it. It was just and just to get fresh air and sunshine and we snapped pictures we actually made a, um, a, a scavenger hunt and I guess okay I can put that in there too we have a scavenger hunt uh, that I put on my blog as a free downloadable um, and scavenger hunts can be really fun for your kids uh, to get that fresh air and look at nature uh, and see if you can find the different things and snap pictures of them and I have one also for the spring um, and uh, anyway uh, but you can look at nature enjoy nature and yes there's no reason not to go out and enjoy nature even in the winter she's already mentioned um, animals and how they cope with the cold and animal signs rocks are also fabulous to study in winter because you can see everything's kind of died back in the ground so you can really find awesome examples of rocks and if you're kind of a winter sissy like I am I really don't like to be out in the cold weather it hurts my body it hurts my joints um, you can study birds from your window that's an awesome nature subject during the winter. Set up a couple of um, bird feeders. You wouldn't even really have to do that. We don't set up a lot of bird feeders. Um, but you can observe a lot of birds and the things that they're doing and, and really learn about those that are indigenous to your area at that time. Awesome. What I'm hearing from all the girls basically is that things are changing so much. Heather mentioned um, tree skeletons. Um, you know, everything basically around you in nature is going to look a little different depending on what season that you're in. Um, Heather, you want to mention, I don't even know, I, well, I know a tree skeleton is sort of, but I mean, what do you think? <laughs> it's just the shape of the tree without the sun. You can study um, and you can identify trees that way. And also, ah. if you look at their branches, you can see um, how many buds and how they're arranged on the tree. And the bark, you can study the bark. Without it, it's fun, kind of cool to see if you can identify a tree without seeing the leaves. So I want to say thank you back to that question about about studying things in the winter time because like I'm I'm listening to all the girls talk and Susan's so passionate and she's cracking me up and then I'm like wow these are things that I never even thought I never thought of I didn't know you could identify a tree by its skeleton or that's just so neat for me. All right. I think um, we've covered just about everything. We don't have any more questions. Is that correct, Marlene? All right. Uh, lucky winner. Lucky winner announcement time, I think, uh, from Marlene, I believe. All right. You ready there? I am ready. So I want to say congratulations to Lucy Cash. You won the Ultimate Naturalist Library from handbookofnaturestudy.com. I'm going to send you a private message through Google Plus to get your email address. And if you didn't win, so go check out handbookofnaturestudy.com where Barb is offering some special discounts for her new naturalist library. Congratulations again, Lucy. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming um, today, spending your afternoon with us. Um, I know that you guys are very busy. Um, and it's so wonderful to have you stop in and join us today. I want to remind everybody to go circle all of our panelists on Google Plus, and I'm going to actually go through everybody once again here in just a second, um, because they're going to be sharing resources, um, 
on their Google Event Plus page or on their on their Google Plus pages. Um, go check out their blogs because I know these ladies have just marvelous resources. Um, for nature studies, free printables, free downloads, ebooks you can pick pick up, all kinds of stuff. Um, and just get out there, get out there and get started. Um, it's kind of a rainy day here in Kentucky, so I don't. I don't foresee any nature studies going on anytime today. Uh, I'm a little bit of a mud. Uh, Cindy's a winter sissy, and I am a mud. I'm a mud sissy. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna avoid that for today. But maybe, maybe when it dries out a little bit more, we'll go out there. All right. I want to thank everybody once again. I have Cindy West, and you can find Cindy at Shining Dawn Books, and also Our Journey Westward. Heather Woody is at blog she wrote. Jamie Worley is at cjamieblog.com. My lovely production manager, Marlene Griffith, is at adiligentheart.com. Susan Evans is easy to find at susanevans.org. And I'm Diana Kennedy. When I'm not representing the iHomeschool Network, you can find me at thekennedyadventures.com. Also, many thanks to Jimmy Landley. She's over in the event room helping things run smoothly over there. Uh, and you can find her at the Notebooking Ferry. Jimmy's Collage and JimmyLanley.com. Um, stay tuned for us. Uh, we have some great stuff coming up in the next few weeks. I believe um, next week is homeschooling and the working mom. Um, so yes, you can homeschool if you still work, uh, and we'll tell you how we do it, how we manage to do it uh, on our panel for our panelists. Uh, taking a break off for the Easter week, and then we'll come back at the end of April um, with special needs and homeschooling. Uh, and then May is chock full of stuff, um, homeschooling year-round, homeschooling on vacation, um, handwriting. Mm, there's two more that I can't that I can't think of. A college credit, yeah, college credit while you're while you're in still in high school, and then also some online classes. So we've got some great stuff coming up um, to wrap up our year. All right, so once again, each and every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, noon Mountain Time, and 11 a.m. for the Pacific Coast. Um, you can also find us over on YouTube. And if those times don't work for you or if you want to take us on the go, um, you can head over to iTunes or Stitcher for Android users and visit us there and take us on the road in a podcast. And if you've done that already, please be sure to give us some thumbs up over there. Okay. Thanks so much for a great afternoon. Thanks, my panel guests, my team members. Love you guys. And then we'll see you back next week. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.